Thank you very much, Zoom. So with that, um, I would like to welcome you again to the Elevate Northwest series. Before um, we introduce our speakers and moderator, just wanna say thank you to our event sponsors, Reach King County and Seattle Public Utilities, and the Chamber's Small Business Champions, Amazon, The Boeing Company, and Microsoft. So now I'm going to introduce our moderator, Katie Terry, to lead us through the rest of the program. Katie is the Executive Director of the Jackson Foundation, joining the organization in 2020. The Henry M. Jackson Foundation fosters and amplifies effective leadership with a focus on climate, human rights, and values-based civic leadership. Prior to this, she served as the Deputy Director and Interim Director of King County Parks for over 10 years. Her previous experience includes work in the nonprofit and public se sectors and supporting her husband with his small business, the Judkins Street Cafe. So Katie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thanks very much, Hannah. And um, I'm really excited to be here today and uh, to introduce the civic leaders, um, the business and civic leaders and hear their insights about their businesses and the communities they serve. Um, I have a lot of respect uh, for this panel and uh, look forward to learning their secrets of how they juggle leadership in their businesses and communities. So as you see, or as you know, um, we have uh, three panelists today. Um, Ephraim Fasaha from Boon Boona Coffee, Joe Fuchere from Tutabella Neapolitan Pizzeria, and Walt Towns from Retail Lockbox. So I'd like to start this off by uh, asking each of you panelists to take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves and your business. And how about we start with Ephraim and then we can move on to Joe and then Walt. Sounds great. Well, first, uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to be here. Uh, really humbled uh, to be able to come and share uh, my experiences uh, and uh, happy to engage and answer any questions uh, uh, here today as well. Uh, my name is Ephraim Fasan. I'm the CEO and founder of Boon Boona Coffee. Uh, we're based in Renton. Uh, I started a business in 2012 and uh, uh, very humble beginnings in, uh, in green coffee, uh, the raw product. And uh, in 2019, opened up our roastery in Renton. Uh, since then, we've opened up our second cafe in, uh, in Seattle, uh, across from Seattle University. Um, but uh, our, our mission is really focused on sourcing, how we source. We source only from Africa. And the reason there was that uh, there was so much opportunity, so much need, um, and uh, and it was after a trip to Africa that I was inspired to get into coffee, and so it all made sense that way. Uh, within our spaces as well, we really try uh, providing a safe space for our community to come in and engage in different ways, and so whether it's King County Health Plan Finder or King County Library reading books to kids or Poetry Night or live music, whatever it is, uh, that represents our community or that gets our community excited. We're all about it. Um, and that's a little bit about us and very fortunate to have survived in such a challenging time. Um, uh, obviously from a health perspective, um, but uh, as a small business as well. So, yeah, thank you so much and grateful to be here. Thanks very much, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Katie and Hannah, again, for the opportunity, as, as Ephraim was saying, to uh, participate in this panel and both to both Ephraim and, and Walt, I have a deep amount of respect uh, for your businesses. I stumbled upon Boom Boona one day when I was uh, in Renton at uh, the hardware store, and it was like the highlight of uh, my week. The, the coffee you know, it was not only delicious, but the, um, the service and the atmosphere, it was just, I just really felt like I was transported. And that, that, that's truly a sign of, of great leadership. And and Walt, Craig and I sat on a number of civic um, uh, boards together and, and I can't um, even uh, speak about uh, enough about uh, how involved civically your company is and, and how much you care about not only your customers, but your employees. So um, I, I, I consider it too honor to be in, in, in the presence of such great um, panelists, co-panelists. Uh, to the bell, if you'd asked me uh, uh, two years ago, what our company was, I would tell you that it was a, we like to call ourselves a family of neighborhood uh, restaurants and um, more specifically Neapolitan Pizzeria certified by the Italian government as authentic. That I know that sounds a little bit stuffy, but it's, it's just the, 
the, the effort that the Italians made to make sure that the margarita pizza, for example, was, was preserved and protected around the, the globe. And we were the first in the Northwest to, to gain that certification. But if you were to ask me today what Tutabella is, you might see behind me, there's, um, there's two signs. There's the Tutabella logo and, and, and just to the side of it, there's the culinary hub. And our company is now divided into two divisions, uh, the hospitality restaurant division, which was 100% of our business pre-COVID and um, now the uh, culinary division, which produces uh, grab and go salads, uh, pastas, desserts, and take and bake pizzas uh, for um, the 60 or so grocery stores that we're in, including Costco, QFC, Fred Meyer, and the Smith Brothers. So a lot to talk about there if you're interested about how we, uh, you know, the, the word pivot is, is, I guess, really appropriate because it, it, it was a survival tactic going into COVID and has become uh, more than 50% of our business today. So a fun story to tell, one of survival that ended up um, in, a, in a thrival mode, if you will, if that's even a word. So that's a little bit about us. Great, thanks, Paul. Katie, thanks for uh, allowing me to join today. Super excited to sit on the panel. Uh, just real quick, uh, Joe, over to you. I, a uh, quick story, I lived in um, New York City for a number of years, and I lived above a pizza shop um, uh, from a guy that was had immigrated from Naples. Um, shockingly, his name was Anthony. Um, shockingly, his wife's name was Rosa, and shockingly, his son's name was Tony. So uh, uh, my kids are, are super in love with, uh, with your pizza there, um, and we enjoy it frequently. We are located basically halfway between your Rainier store and Ephraim, uh, we're right over by your, um, your store here uh, across from Seattle U that I believe is the old Cherry Street Pizza. I'm, I'm in Cherry Street Coffee, I'm not sure. So I've had many meetings over there and now that you guys have taken over, I'm excited to get over there and check it out. Um, for everybody else here on the, um, that's joining us today, thanks for letting me uh, chat with you. Um, unlike uh, Joe and Ephraim's uh, businesses, we're a lot less fun and exciting than they are. <laughs> What we do is we do payment processing of accounts receivable processing. So uh, next month will be our 28th year in business. And basically what we do is we process uh, anything, anytime your business wants to collect money from your customers, uh, we're there to help you. So if that means uh, your customers are sending you a check and you want someone to deposit that check into your bank account and then send you a posting file and let you know how much, um, how much your customer paid uh, we send a customized posting file to up, upload into your accounts receivable uh, accounting software system. Um, and we do that on a daily basis. Uh, we also, if you have, if your company wants to accept online payments, either for, say, it could be anything from uh, accepting payments for insurance payments to, um, to uh, tenant, uh, tenants paying rents to anything in between uh, driving schools, uh, a lot of utility companies, we power their back end. Um, our customer base is, is uh, very diverse. We're about 30% uh, state and local government, about 30% healthcare, and about 40% everything else that's uh, from everything from uh, nonprofits to insurance companies, phone companies, et cetera. Um, and that's basics of us. And we're also just branching out into starting to help companies where their accounts payable processing with some new, uh, new technology that's out there to help uh, make that process uh, more smooth. So super excited to talk to everybody today. Thanks for letting me join. Great, thank you. So I have some questions that we're gonna, um, uh, I'm gonna be tossing out to each of you and sometimes having just one person answer, but please feel free. If you have something else you wanna add to that, please do. And a few that I'm gonna ask you all to kind of take a turn in answering, and then we'll be opening up to um, questions from the audience. So, um, Walt, I'm going to toss this one your way. Um, how do you define leadership versus management? And what is the value of each? For us, we embrace um, what we call a servant leader uh, model, meaning that um, as leaders in our company, if you're on the management team or the leadership team, anything from the CEO to the CFO to uh, supervisor, um, we view our job as, as being servants towards our team, so our employee team. So that means, uh, what that means is making sure that they're 
inputs are respected and understanding that most of the best ideas are gonna come from them. Um, so making sure that they have both access to management um, as well as the ability to, to really make a difference on an individual basis. So I would say that's what uh, we would classify under the leadership side. Um, and the other, your other half of your question was, I'm sorry. Oh, it was leadership versus management. Yeah, leadership versus, so I, I would call that the, the leadership philosophy. Uh, the management side is, I guess, just all the X's and O's. You know, in today's world, there's so many um, HR requirements. There are so um, many, um, it's laws after laws after laws that you have to make sure that you're, you're uh, abiding by, uh, which is not a small feat in today's environment. So I guess I would call that the, the management side, everything from managing your customer flows to just basically the nuts and bolts of it, I guess. Great. Joe or Ephraim, do you have anything you want to add to that? Ephraim? Yeah, I, I, I second that. Um, truly leadership is, uh, you know, uh, willing to do whatever it takes to support your team. And I, um, certain lessons that I've gained having worked for previous employers, um, uh, you kind of learn, uh, you know, what good leadership has been, what bad leadership has been. And, uh, um, and I, I find that, you know, the, the willingness to, to get in there and do whatever task it is um, that you're asking of your team, that's one thing uh, for leadership. Um, uh, but then on the management side, I do agree that it is a lot of that, you know, policies, procedures, the legal, the that is where it's uh, really at. And, um, and I almost find the leadership coming in as a friend, as someone there to support and the management being there to be like, okay, well, these are the expectations um, and very distinct. Uh, there, there's very clear differences between the two. Um, uh, agreed, agreed. Like ditto, ditto, all the, all the above. I wrote down servant leadership because it is something that we all kind of aspire to. And I think that uh, with servant leadership, you you really, to me, it's one thing to say it. It's not quite another to live it. And the way I gauge this it is we have a we have a director of operations, for example. His, his name is Chad. And the difference between his style of leadership and his the his predecessor is that when he visits one of our uh, locations, when he walks in the door, he, people are happy to see him. Like, they're like, we feel supported. We always feel like you add something instead of take something away uh, from our jobs. I think that, I think that all leaders, you know, have to be managers at one point because there are the, the X's and O's um, uh, as Walt said, but I, I don't know if all managers ever elevate and, and reach the level of, of, of true leadership. The, the person who paints that North star that everybody can kind of get on board with uh, the person that looks at purpose over mission, you know, mission might be what we do as an organization, but purpose is why we do it. And I think when you can, as a leader, can help people understand why certain things are done, they start to feel appreciated and they start to perform at a higher level because they're part of it. They're, they're engaged, they're, they have ownership. Um, and I think a leader's job is to help, is to kind of get out of the way almost sometimes and, and let others do their jobs and help them grow. Whereas a man, manager sometimes, especially when they're poor managers, they, and, and again, their management is part of all leaders. Um, but when it, when it's not done well, uh, people feel repressed and held back instead of, um, up, uplifted and, and inspired, which I would say is more on the leadership side. Thanks. So kind of following up from that a bit, um, you're all known for the work that you do uh, in your communities. And knowing that this is different for different types of businesses, I'm curious, how do you decide which ways you'll get involved with the community? Uh, for you, is this a business decision or is it a civic duty? Uh, probably some of both, but how, how do you approach that? Um, so Joe, how about we start with you? Any of your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it, it, it started with, the values that were instilled in me by my mother, honestly. She was a very generous, kind, caring person. And her, her community was our, at the time with our neighbors. And, you know, they, they'd come over on, you know, once a week and, and my mom would, you know, 
um, they play cards or she'd do their hair or whatever it was. It was just kind of this communal social thing. And they would bring with them problems and they would bring with them challenges with their families. And when I opened my restaurant, maybe I was the accidental, you know, community activist or involvement, but it was just kind of, I took those values of being part of not just what was inside the four walls, but maybe the four blocks around the, 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 the restaurant. And, you know, people come in and you just feel like they bring needs to you. It could be a, a parent who is, is uh, a volunteer for the nonprofit or the school that they work with. And I think it's just kind of never saying no to people, like finding a way to understand and appreciate what they're doing. It doesn't mean you have to write a $5,000 check and sponsor the little league, but you could maybe give them free pizza at their opening game. I mean, it's just this creative way of, of being part of a community and being part of, um, you know, not just looking within what's going to make my business successful within the four walls. It's thinking outside the four walls and, and being open to the simple solutions that may not always take money. Cause in small businesses, one of our biggest challenges is, is managing, you know, the bottom line. Uh, Cause it's usually, uh, uh, at least in my, in my business, it's, it's pretty thin, but it's, it's about the, the, the enrichment, enrichment that you get by just engaging in, in the, the, the things outside your four walls. Great. Efren, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, um, for me, it was, you know, when I was getting started, you know, and to Walton, you know, like I'm probably the, the newest into this space of uh, business ownership. Um, but, um, you know, when I got started in 2012, I was, uh, I was I was trying my best to get you know funding from banks and uh, and getting those roadblocks, and I remember that you know once I resolved that okay I can't have what it is that I have now which is the grocery and cafe and all these other good things okay humble yourself go 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 the longer route source some good green coffee become familiar with your product the first stores that were willing to take our product were mom and pop shops, East African based. It was the Somali owned grocers in the um, SeaTac Taquila area, uh, which are hubs for a lot of East Africans from Sudan to Somalians to Ethiopians, Eritreans and such, uh, to be able to go there to get their you know traditional spices. And we were fortunate enough to be provided space on their shelves. It took a lot of work to get that, but I knew Safeway would never give me that opportunity. I knew that I would have another grocery give me that, that chance, but they believed in what it was that I was doing. And I, I, kept, uh, I kept that in mind. I kept that in, you know, in the forefront of my mind as to when the opportunity comes to have a space um, that I need to reciprocate that to my community as well. Um, and in, I think within the first month of opening up our cafe in Renton, we had our first pop-up and it was someone who was aspiring to open up their own cafe and they were going to do it with traditional sambusas, which are, you know, these deep fried little doughs with meat or lentils inside of it. Delicious. And I said, yeah, you know, like, come on in, um, you know, there's space and sell them and, uh, and that was the start of something. And it was during that event that I realized that this space has the potential to serve a greater purpose than just dispensing out coffee. We could do a little bit more. It's become a hub for our community. Um, you know, we were fortunate enough that a lot of support came in, especially at uh, those earlier days from even artists like Yigzao, Michael, who has done phenomenal work throughout the King County area, but, you know, he, he came in and built a beautiful mural for us. And so it said, okay, let's get artists in here. And, you know, even behind me, Aramis has art up and she's sold, so, you know, several of these pieces here and a hundred percent of it goes to her. It's these small things um, that, uh, you know, really mean the most. Um, it, it means the most to the community. It means the most to myself, honestly. Selfishly, I get a lot of joy out of it. So uh, it's satisfying in a lot of different ways. And, and it's naturally um, 
become that and it's grown and evolved. I mean, even beyond, you know, because obviously with COVID, we've been very cautious of having pop-up events because we know it draws a crowd. So, okay, take it outside, find causes that are out in the community. And so, you know, when we were able to get our coffee into grocers like QFC and such, you know, we said, okay, we're going to be intentional with this. So let's give 5% of our profits then and find two nonprofit organizations in the community that we can support. One was Feast Seattle. Another one is Vision House. And as small as we are, it's like, at least we're doing something. We're giving something of ourselves. It feels more than just, you know, the financial gain or anything. It's how could we stay connected to our community and do some good? Um, because I do believe that, you know, yeah, you know, our bottom lines are important. Being a for-profit business is, is definitely something that's, you know, necessary for this organization. But we could be socially conscious. We could be, we can look for those opportunities. And, and uh, you know, fortunately, we're still here um, as a result of these uh, decisions. Uh, and it's, 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 it's very rewarding in a lot of different ways to get to do that kind of stuff, honestly. So I'm going to answer the question really specifically as it relates to me. I think that's the best way I can answer this question. So for me, it's a blend. Some things are projects of passion. Um, I'm super passionate about voting rights and, and voter education. Um, and I taught uh, voter education around the country, actually. Um, I don't think it does any good um, for our business, except for I'm super excited about it um, and could you know, spend the next hour talking to you about it. Um, and then other projects, um, other projects are what I would say, you know, they have some community value, but they're also um, have uh, growth or meaningful to our business. So we're located on uh, 14th and Yesler. So once we moved into this building, um, I joined the local uh, community board um, and eventually became uh, president of the, the local community association. Um, which also included, uh, Ephraim, just for reference, uh, the building of that park across the street from you guys' cafe there. Um, and so in that case, it was important because, um, you know, we were owners of our building here and we wanted to be engaged in the neighborhood. And, and when the neighborhood does well, we do well. Um, what, so in that case, it's, it's a little bit of both, right? So it helps us, but it also helps the community. What I would say to, um, and I think we're really focused on small business today. So what I would say is however you do it, you need to be engaged in your community on some level in a way that promotes your business. Um, figure out what your passions are and you're probably in your business because you have passion for it. Um, so figure out how you can bring that passion out into the community. It's obvious, I think with Joe and and Ephraim, in terms of what they're doing, it might be a little bit less obvious than someone like us where we're a you know, payment processor, right? Um, that, that doesn't necessarily automatically engage. But I think you have to be out pushing your business. You have to be out uh, in front of the folks that you're your customers. The other thing um, I wanted to just circle back, Katie, for a second on that leadership question. Again, we're talking about small business here. So I think in small business, you... You have to have, you have to show your team and your customers the commitment to what you're doing. And it's not talking about it, it's letting them see you. So for example, here at our, um, um, in the last month, you know, I, I pick up the garbage around the building myself um, every day and I have for the last, um, you know, eight years. Last week when it was snowing, we still have to get to work. So um, I'm driving around and personally picking up um, picking up our employees because we still have to get the work done. And I'm driving from on a daily basis. I was driving about 220 miles in the snow to get people from all the way from Montlake Terrace and as far south as Tacoma on a daily basis. So my favorite saying about small business, and I think that's what we're talking about today, is uh, the, best, the best thing about owning your own business is you only have to work half days. Just pick whichever 12 hours you like. Um, and I think that um, so your business is especially, um, if you're not doing that, then you're smarter than me and please call me after this so <laughs> I can figure out how to, to be better. Um, but, but I think you have to, in a small business, you have to lead by example and your, your team needs to see that you're out there and committed as, as well, not just your team, but also your customers, right? Um, so anyway, I just want to add to that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, um, if, I, if, if, if it's okay, um, 
Walt and and Ephraim both. I mean, as I listen to you guys talk about what you like to do yourselves, what those things that are important personally do project um, and are important because we are spending a lot of time in our businesses and you might as well have fun. And, and it's, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of stress. And if you're passionate about something, you know, that's the great thing about being a business owner is that you, you get to do the things you want to do. And uh, it comes, it, 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 it emanates. I mean, it, it, it's in your DNA and people feel it and they feel your passion. And it, it's hugely, hugely important in terms of um, the, the, the role modeling that, that Walt talked about and the passion that, that Ephraim uh, talked about for sure. So we have a, a kind of a different question for you all. Um, have you had an experience where you got constructive feedback, either from someone on your team, the community, uh, your customers, and you know, how, how did you deal with it? It really kind of, kind of, do you have an example of a good leader learning from constructive feedback? or maybe a pitfall. So Joe, I'm gonna to toss that to you first. Okay. Well, uh, it's appropriate to toss it to me because I like to talk a lot. And um, it, again, if I could use uh, some, my, some of my, my mother's advice, it's, you know, you were born with two ears and one mouth and, you know, I, I need to get better at listening. And I think when, you're, when your employees and your customers or, or your business partners or your vendors or whoever they might be, you know, they're trying to tell you something and you're not listening because you want to get out there and, and talk about what's important to you. Um, I, it's, I think once I allowed people to give me feedback and ask for it, and I think that's the important part is, is that if you're running a business or you're, you're the CEO of a business and you have, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the top of the, totem pole, if you will, or, or if you're doing an in, in, inverted pyramid style, you're the bottom, whatever it might be, people are afraid to give you that feedback. They need permission. And I think you, you start by saying, what, what am I not listening to? What do I need to hear that I haven't been hearing? And that, that opens up so many more opportunities um, for you to improve as a, as a leader, just being open to feedback. Great. Yeah, Joe's, Joe's, Joe's spot on with that. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do better is really use a little bit, uh, a, a better job because you get feedback almost every day, <laughs> you know, whether it's from your staff, whether it's from your partners, uh, you know, it's, it's constant from your customers, constantly getting it. And uh, it's sometimes this like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, cool, 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 yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> and you're just kind of like, right. Right, just I don't even want to like, just trying to get past it. Uh, cause you got other things in your mind, but, um, you know, taking that moment, um, and, 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 and processing it as, is that an opportunity? Is that something that needs to be, uh, is that, is that a process that needs to be changed? Is that, you know, is your, you know, delay, are you coming in late so frequently it's becoming a problem? Uh, my own self meaning, you know, to a meeting or, um, uh, and, and being present um at meetings um and those types of things you know that feedback uh because it is so constant because we are at the top or the bottom of the you know total floor um it's uh, it's constant uh, but i think still not becoming numb to it is definitely something that i'm trying to um do a better job at um because i've gotten accustomed to it <laughs> exactly and so and so not getting accustomed to that feedback is important um so that you can take it in use discernment um and properly act on the things that need to because not all, all that feedback is going to be beneficial or helpful but it's important to still give it an ear because maybe there is a space for it for me, I would say in, in business, you're either growing or you're dying. You're very rarely staying in the same place. Um, the feedback, the negative feedback that I've had in the past is, you know, while you're micromanaging me um, and nobody likes to be micromanaged um, as small business owners. I mean, we, my business partner and I started with just two of us. And so, you know, it, it takes practice as a business owner to hand off things because as many of us in our personalities as business owners are doers, um, that doesn't automatically make you a good delegator, but if you wanna grow your business, 
um, you're going to have to learn to grow by by delegating and trusting people. And um, so I would say that um, that would be one with mine. And I would say to any of us, as we want to grow our small businesses and make them bigger, you better get good people. You better um, trust them with what you know they're doing and and you know let them do their job. Great. So we have a couple of questions that have popped up from the audience that I'm gonna that I'm gonna pose to you. Um, the first one is: if you had the capacity to add a function in your business, what would it be? More HR support, IT, marketing, R and D. Walt, I'm going to start with you. Oh, although Ephraim looked like no, he was great. go to Walt, please. Don't no, go to no, Walt. No. Go to I Walt. got excited. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, definitely. Live that's area. E that's easy. Sales, sales, yeah. sales. Okay. Um, if the, the sales is the heartbeat of any business, um, you can be great at everything else, but if you're not out there generating new business, um, you're not going to be around that long. So any anything in terms of sales that could mean a new product that I could that I could uh, sell and, and get new customers. That could mean a new person that could sell, you know, do a good job of selling and representing our company. I, I would say anything that drives revenue if you had to ask me to choose one. Okay. Ephraim, you look like you're ready now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I'm definitely ready. Uh, so if I could have any position right now, um, I think the, you know, I had to be very honest about it because prior to, uh, you know, when I was opening up my business, you know, I knew I lacked in lots of areas to, to be a great leader. And so I said, you know what, I've got the finance and accounting because that's been my background. Uh, you know, that's what I worked in for a number of years. And so I felt pretty good about my numbers side, but uh, I, I didn't feel as confident about, you know, HR, uh, management, um, legal and so I was like, you know what, let me get back into school. Let me get my MBA. And so at the same time as I opened up the cafe, I was getting my MBA to like try seeing if I could educate myself on the things that I lacked in. But certain things are needed immediately. And those are, you know, like HR is, is definitely something that is needed. And so I think if anything, um, in the last two and a half years, uh, so starting this and hiring you know, employees and such, I think that's one area that I would definitely still say that I would love to have more support in uh, and creating that, you know, that culture and that space. So what we talk about is what I got into this with was, you know, a desire for a very uh, a welcoming space for employees, for teammates to be able to grow in coffee, um, to become, you know, Q graders and all, you know, just just these lofty desires that I had for what I want people in, in coffee. But, uh, you know, I, I think that just knowing your weak areas, um, I would definitely still say HR be that area. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, but now we've gotten the support in certain ways and uh, we've got some consulting and stuff like that, but that's the one space. I think, I think managing your employees and managing your team is definitely a very important part. Um, and, and, doing it right from the jump is always good. Great, Joe? Yeah, I would say that there are certain, you know, all organizations need, an, you know, like a accounting function, an HR function, uh, operations function, um, sales. Uh, and, and so this is a little, this is a great, great question because we are, we are down an HR person right now. So we absolutely have to find that person. But after that position's filled, I think that uh, procurement specialist. Be, the COVID has created all kinds of challenges mm. in getting the supply chain and getting products, everything from paper to you know products from Italy or whatever. And then finally, so that, that would be my next kind of on my wish list. But my ultimate dream would be to have a, a minister of fund, you know, somebody that we uh, can hire that we can just afford to hire and say your whole job. And it probably falls into the HR position, but we have to recognize and you know in order to generate revenue, we have to keep turnover low because we want people that are good at what they do, especially in the service industry, you have to get seasoned uh, bartenders and employees and cooks. And if we can, if we could have someone that just their sole job is to create fun and, and, and in, a, in order to recognize the employees that we have, that would be kind of a, almost a dream come true for me. 
So I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, kind of connected with another question I had. Has that changed due to COVID for you? Has, has, has that or other things about your leadership style changed due to COVID? There's only one aspect of it that's changed and that's the social aspect, I, I think. I mean, it's, maybe there's more, but the one that's so obvious is we uh, recently um, celebrated all the people that were able to make it to work by, um, we had this really fun uh, pop-up tamale contest where, because in Italy it's all about who makes the, which family makes the best sauce. In, in my workforce, mostly uh, uh, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Mexican, if you want to, however you want to classify them, they, um, tamales it's like which family makes the best tamales and so we had this impromptu contest and we we closed down operations for a couple hours and did a, a tamale um contest and had prizes and awards and i can't tell you how much that the feedback that we got later was that was incredibly fun and it it you just gained so much um uh, energy and and appreciation and and, and performance. If you want to, you know, call it a business uh, 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 decision, but it, it really wasn't at the time. Um, uh, that was the maybe the unexpected consequences that people really felt more engaged and wanted to come back to work. But they the overwhelming feedback was more pleased. You know, can we do more of these things that didn't really cost us anything but a bunch of time um, and uh, or some time? It, it was awesome. So that's that's one example of how you bring fun into the workplace. Ephraim, what, what about what about you? Has anything changed for leadership for you due to COVID? Yeah, I think uh, you know one of the areas that have changed for me between for my team, you know, it's it's okay. It's the impacts of COVID, and so how do I keep them safe as? they're constantly also expressing how they feel safe or unsafe, taking that into consideration. And then also what policies or what is being recommended and being able to apply those changes. And so staying on top of this constant changing um, of individual, of team, comfortability, policies changing, um, and then also what the requirements are. And, and it's been more of doing my best to understand the rules. You know, the one thing about a small business is that, you know, you don't have necessarily all the, uh, the resources available to decipher all the rules behind the, you know, recent changes to CDC. It's like, and, and or, you know, public health. and being able not necessarily in a negative way of saying like oh that's there's a lot of restrictions it's just understanding making sense of it and then having to clearly communicate that to your team um you really like it requires a whole team you know and so sometimes you're looking to you know the big players you're looking at starbucks how is starbucks approaching it you know as a coffee business i'm you know how are they going about it okay what they must have interpreted in this way so they're doing it this way and then saying okay maybe i can apply that process only because i don't have the means the time because when someone tells you that hey i tested positive for covid well okay you know i need to put an action plan together asap um, and how many people did it impact and all that so my leadership uh change has been in trying to find resources and finding individuals, reliable individuals within those spaces to ask those questions, to be able to decipher for me uh, in, in, uh, in layman's terms, uh, so that not necessarily just that I'm following the rules, but I'm applying the best process for, for, for safety purposes, you know, and that's um, not that I'm gonna get a fine or a fee, but that, this is really what I'm, you know, this is what's going to keep us safe until we know otherwise that, oh, we can, you know, we can, we can make that change. And, you know, honestly, even when, you know, as, as, you know, we've been going through COVID for the last two years here now, you know, I remember there was a point last summer when, you know, it was recommended that, hey, you know, no more masks. I said, you know what, let's just keep the masks on for a little bit longer, <laughs> only because 
there's a possibility that that rule may change. Um, the verdict's still ain't out. I'll just give it some more time. And sometimes I would apply this process of hold. Okay, rule changed. Just wait a little while. Give it some time. See if we revert back to that thing that we're no longer having to do. Um, and if it's all clear, then yeah, move forward. So for example, you know, about only a month and a half ago did we start doing indoor seating. Very cautious and very slow to it, probably in comparison to most. But we wanted to take those precautions because once again, being as knowledgeable about what it is that you need to implement from a safety perspective um, and from a uh, requirements perspective, it's it's a lot, and especially for a small business. And so uh, that's been mine. I don't know if it's just being more overly cautious, but uh, it, that's been my approach. Great. Well, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you're going to have a range of, of opinions within your team. Mm -hmm. um, and that was certainly the case with us. Um, but we really focused on safety first and tried to stay out in front of well ahead of any regulations that were coming out for the CDC. So we we found a local um, seamstress person and had masks manufactured before you could still get them. Um, we started this week because of the Omicron, we started um, supplying the N95 masks to our team and asking them, providing them and asking them to wear them. I think what you're gonna find is while there's a wide range of, of opinions, everybody wants to be safe. So our focus was, we need you to stay safe for yourself, for your family, and for your coworkers, and for our customers. And so in order to do that, that means we all have to be, um, we all have to take precautions sometimes that people don't want to make. And some people were really uh, reluctant to wear masks and really push back hard in the beginning. But you have to remember, or at least we had to remember that there's 15 other people that are not going to come to work are going to be really pissed off if that one person that's pushing back on the mask isn't, isn't uh, so you're, you're, I guess your employees have to feel safe. And I think regardless of whether or not they necessarily always verbalize it and some certainly will, um, but in COVID, I think you have to show them that you care about them um, and that you put their safety above everything else. Hey, Katie, um, um, I just realized before I went off on the tamale tangent that I probably didn't answer your your question. And I just want to echo what both Ephraim and Walt said in, in terms of what's changed, you know, during COVID in, in, in leadership. And I, I think that for me, it, it, it was communicating clearly a, a chance to communicate to everybody in the organization that we care about their health and safety. And we may make some mistakes like Ephraim saying, how do you interpret the multiple contradictions that come your way? But at the end of the day, if you're, if you're, if your guests and more importantly, your, 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 uh, employees feel like their health and safety is more important to you than anything else, then it, it's okay for you to make a mistake once in a while because they know your effort is to try to protect them. Great. Thank you. So we're getting close to the end of our time. I have a question from the audience and then depending on how quickly we go through that, we may have one speed round at the end. So the question from the audience is, um, since we've just started a new year, do you have any leadership resolutions? So Ephraim, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, wow. Oh. I think to be a better manager, I think to be a better manager, I think to kind of speak to the things that Walt and Joel had been talking about earlier. Uh, I think uh, showing up as a leader for sure is something that I wanna say I do really well, but it's, it's something that I feel pretty good about. But on the manager side, really, um, really stepping it up uh, and 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 making some changes, making some improvements um, for the better. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I think I think uh, I think the team is also so it should be fun. Great. Well, how about you? Any resolutions? A, a couple. Um, one is um, significantly more training, proactive training, both uh, and, and cross training. Uh, within what we're doing and then we have a very concerted effort right now we've put together a a leadership team and we're really trying to drive we're really trying to push out responsibility and accountability um, 
to those leaders um, and let them run uh, with their areas and let them set their um, their criterion for how they should be measured and what their results are. Great. Joe? If uh, 2021 was the year or the year of sur survival, 2022 will be the, the year of thriving. And I think we take everything that we learned and, and apply it. And to, uh, to Walt's point, it's, and, 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 and even Ephraim's was this commitment to not only be better leaders, but to help others grow uh, personally and professionally. So my last question for each of you, if you wanna take about a minute is, what's the final piece of advice that you'd like to give to the audience? Especially if somebody was just starting out, or you can think of it as what, if you were speaking to your younger self, what is a piece of advice that you would give yourself? So Joe, I'm gonna start with you. Don't stop uh, doing what you love. You got into this business because you had a passion and a love and you can get distracted. And there, will, there are times when external forces that you feel are out of your control are pushing you a different way. You have to get back to your core and you have to continue to, to do what, what got you into this business because that's what your, that's what your customers count on. It's what your employees count on. So Great. Do, do what you love. Walt, do you want to go next? I, I would say if you're not passionate about what you're doing in a small business, you're going to have a hard time being successful. So um, I would make sure to ask yourself the question, you know, my passion about this for the long run, or at least until my passion enough about this to get it to where the next, you know, to the next level, um, I would, I would say that would be a big piece. And then I, you know, I'm always come back to, to, to you, you have to, if you want to stay in business, you have to be bringing in new customers um, and continuing to grow your customer base. So I think you can never take your eyes off the ball and making sure that you're always, um, you're, you're always growing. I don't know very many businesses that can stay at one level and, and be successful without, uh, without that. Great. And Ephraim, you want to close us out? Yeah, passion, passion, passion. <laughs> uh, see where your heart's at. That's uh, that's 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 where you need to be going. And uh, um, you know, the only reason why I got into coffee was I was just that passionate about it and what I felt that the impact could be um, if I did it slightly different than what I had seen. Um, and that's what I've been pursuing. And I think that whatever um, whatever it is that you find joy in, go for it. I always add the fact that you know. Uh, do it for not just the financial gain, but do it for more than just yourself. Uh, you know, do it for others. Do do it so that it impacts somebody else as well. Positively impact somebody else uh, along the way. Uh, financial gain is great and all, but uh, it's not end all be all. Um, it re you know really, I I do enjoy you know the events. I do enjoy finding great causes to support. Uh, I do enjoy buying coffee from farmers and producers in Africa. So that's, that's, that's what keeps me going. That's what fuels me. Um, and if I get to keep doing that, I don't, I don't know when I would stop. So, you know, and even on the hardest of days, I'm still happy that I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no role. There's no position that can pull me away from what it is that I'm doing. Cause I'm just so passionate about it and so happy about it. So find that thing. That's great. Thank you. So uh, that kind of closes out our session. One thing I want to say is, again, just how much uh, tremendous respect I have for all three of you. Uh, having having uh, been married to a small business owner for uh, <laughs> a few years uh, or being able to see it uh, up close and personal, just what a labor of love that it is you know, for your staff, for your community, and was just really struck um, specifically about things that you talked about, about the importance of small things um, and of valuing staff, especially making them feel valued and safe. And just really neat to hear both your passion and how that's coupled with humility. So it's just uh, really inspiring to hear. And uh, Hannah, we also really appreciate that uh, you would allow the Jackson Foundation to have a little hand in this today. So thanks very much for having me come and moderate. I'll turn Absolutely. it back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So as Katie says, that wraps up our program for today. Um, join me in virtually giving a big round of applause to um, our speakers and Katie as our moderator today. In the chat, um, you'll see that I included links to all of the um, small businesses featured today. So be sure to visit those and get out and have some pizza and some coffee and have your payments processed by Retail <laughs> Lockbox. Um, so also just want to one more time thank our sponsors, Reach King County, Seattle Public Utilities, and our small business champions, Amazon, Boeing, and Microsoft. Um, and thank you to all of you. Uh, we will see you hopefully soon in person, um, but hopefully soon in general as well. So have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Great day, everybody. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Thanks, thank Katie. You. Bye, everybody. Bye.